Regardless of what anyone says, it's thanks to Alan Rickman and his unparalleled acting that Professor Snape has so many fans today. He managed to embody a very attractive image on screen that is simply impossible not to love. And although the Snape from the adaptation is very similar to his prototype, there are differences between them. The book Snape is not as cold-blooded as Rickman's character. He often shows emotions and usually does not hide his malevolent nature. Moreover, unlike the stern but on the whole fair Severus from the films who commands respect from the audience, the original character is more spiteful, vindictive and petty. However, this does not prevent him from being the bravest man Harry knew. Despite all his flaws, Snape really did a lot to protect Potter and defeat the Dark Lord. But let's move on from general words to specific examples. Misconception number one, special treatment. Professor Snape hated Harry the moment the boy first stepped through the doors of Hogwarts. The aftermath of an old trauma that Severus never managed to overcome. Harry was too much like his father. But if in the films, the relationship between Potter and Snape is just strained, in the books, they are openly hostile. This difference is immediately noticeable. Take the first potions lesson as an example. In the film, Severus decides to teach the boy, who is busy with his own things and is eagerly writing something down, literally ignoring the professor standing before him. Such audacity! Such a student needs to be put in his place immediately. And although this was just a misunderstanding, and Harry was not only attentively listening to Snape, but also taking notes on his words, something not even the diligent Hermione did, Severus had a clear reason to pounce on the boy with questions, which is why the scene does not elicit major complaints. Unlike what happened in the book, in the source material, Snape attacked Harry without any reason. Potter did not provoke him at all. And thanks to this small difference, the entire scene is perceived completely differently because instead of some justified disciplinary action, Severus simply began to take out all the grievances Jamis had once caused him on the boy. Quote, After this short speech, the silence that had reigned in the class became absolute. Harry and Ron, raising their eyebrows, exchanged puzzled looks. Hermione Granger impatiently shuffled in her chair. Evidently, she was eager to prove that she could not possibly be considered part of the herd of fools. Potter, Snape said unexpectedly. What will I get if I mix powdered root of asphodel with an infusion of wormwood? Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. And that's just the beginning. Even if Severus wanted to show Potter that fame does not make him special, it does not justify his systematic, often unwarranted nitpicking. For example, in that very first lesson, he somehow managed to blame Harry for Neville's mistake, even though Harry was just sitting next to him. Quote, Idiot! Snape snarled, sweeping the spilled potion into the corner with a flick of his hand. As I understand, before removing the cauldron from the fire, you added porcupine quills to the potion? Neville cringed and started crying in response. Now his nose was covered with red blisters. Take him to the hospital wing, Snape said, grimacing, turning to Seamus. Then he turned to Harry and Ron, who were working at the next table. You, Potter, why didn't you tell him that you can't add porcupine quills to the potion? Or did you think if he made a mistake, you would look better than him? Because of you, I'm awarding another penalty point against Gryffindor. It was terribly unfair. Harry had already opened his mouth to object when Ron kicked him under the table. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. You just want to say, man, it's actually your job. The kid has nothing to do with it. Stop taking it out on him. Do you even realize the absurdity of the situation? It's only the first lesson. Most kids in the class have never brewed potions before, and Snape, not only did he fail to monitor the student, but he also managed to blame Potter for it. And I remind you just earlier, Severus had already confirmed that Harry knows nothing about potion making. So what is he accusing him of? Not to mention that it was Snape who chose the potion and provided the ingredients. 
which in the hands of an inexperienced novice, i.e. absolutely any first-year student could be dangerous, I'm at a loss for words. This one episode generates more hatred for the character than all the movies combined, and it perfectly demonstrates Snape's unfairly biased attitude towards Harry. But there's more. In the second film, Snape may suspect Harry of attacking Mrs. Norris, as he directly tells Dumbledore and everyone present. But he doesn't resort to baseless accusations and tries to get to the truth. I love this moment, but what do we have in the book? Quote, I think, Mr. Director, Potter is clearly hiding something. Punish him and he will tell the truth. I would remove him from the Gryffindor team. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Correct. The book Snape suggests punishing Potter simply because he deems him guilty by default. Proof is clearly unnecessary for him. It's like sending someone to Azkaban without a trial and investigation just based on suspicion. Ah, yes. Hagrid. So this is the norm in the wizarding world. Fortunately, Dumbledore's words about the presumption of innocence cool the professor's zeal. But if it were up to him, he would sick a snake on Potter, I have no doubt about it. At least because, in the book, it was he who advised Malfoy to do so during the duel. At least that's how it's presented. A quote, Snape whispered something in Malfoy's ear, and he nodded with a nasty smile. Harry noticed this and asked Lockhart to repeat the defensive move. Serpent Sortia! There was a sound like a gunshot before the stunned Harry's eyes. A long black snake shot out of Malfoy's wand and slapped onto the floor. The spectators in the front recoiled in horror. Someone screamed shrilly. Stand still, Potter, Snape said with feigned benevolence, enjoying Harry's confusion. I'll take care of it now. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. In the film, the summoning of the snake is Malfoy's initiative and Snape's desire to help seems genuine without any feigned benevolence. Yes, he enjoyed the duel and provoked Draco to act more decisively, but when it came to real danger, he immediately became serious and stopped the fight that had gone too far, because despite his open dislike for Potter, Snape always tried to protect him. This dedication is perfectly illustrated in a scene from the third film, an enraged Snape lunges at Harry, who dared to attack him, but upon noticing a werewolf, immediately without a second thought, shields the children with his body. All of them, even the detested Potter. This moment did not occur in the book. Severus came to too late, but I have no doubt that he would have done exactly that had he had the chance. However, considering Book Snape's love for shouting about how he always has to save ungrateful Potter, this scene could have turned out completely different. That's Severus for you, he grumbles, but he still comes to the rescue. By the way, he viewed the situation in the Shrieking Shack precisely from this perspective. Quote, like father, like son, I just saved your life, Potter. You should be on your knees thanking me. You ought to have been killed. You would have died like your father, too arrogant to believe that Black could have tricked you. Now get out of the way, Potter, or I will make you move. Harry Potter and the prisoner of Azkaban. And, of course, his biased attitude over time went nowhere. Snape continued to consider Potter inherently guilty in any trouble. Your blessed father was involved in all injustices. For example, Sirius's escape he instantly attributed to Harry and Hermione without any evidence. And although this time Severus turned out to be right, it does not justify him. Just as in the case with Mrs. Norris's attack, someone else could have been the culprit. However, note Snape's behavior. He was never shown this enraged in the films. Quote, the door burst open with a bang. Fudge, Snape and Dumbledore burst into the ward. Dumbledore was the only one who remained calm. Moreover, he looked openly pleased with himself. Fudge was clearly angry, but Snape was furious. Out with it, Potter! He bellowed. What have you done? It was them. They helped him escape, I know. Snape raged 
his face contorted, spitting as he pointed at Harry and Hermione. Calm down, dear fellow, roared Fudge. You're talking nonsense. You don't know Potter. He did it. I know he did. Snape stood, seething with rage. He looked at Fudge, shocked by his behavior at Dumbledore, whose eyes twinkled behind his glasses, expressing nothing and turning with such fury that his cloak swished violently behind him, he stormed out of the ward. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. After the Goblet of Fire incident, Book Snape, of course, rushed to blame Harry again. He didn't even consider that external forces might be involved. The score is 2.1 against Severus's intuition. Quote, Karkaroff, it's all Potter's doing. Snape said smoothly, his black eyes gleaming maliciously. It's not Dumbledore's fault that Potter broke the rules of the tournament. This wretched boy has done nothing but break the rules since the day he arrived at the school. Thank you, Severus, Dumbledore said crisply. Snape fell silent and stepped aside, but his eyes continued to emit malicious sparks. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire the nitpicking in lessons didn't go away either. Even in the fifth year, Snape continued to pick on Harry. For example, he gave Potter the worst possible grade for preparing the draft of peace, simply because he forgot to add one of the ingredients. Meanwhile, Goyle's potion, prepared with far more mistakes, didn't elicit any complaints from him. Misconception number two, justice. And this is another detail that the movies glossed over softly. No matter how much of a troll in human guise Goyle was, no matter how many mistakes he made or rules he broke, his allegiance to Slytherin resolved any issues. At least, Snape would do everything in his power. As a consequence, if any conflict arises between Gryffindors and Slytherins, Severus would never punish the latter. Even if they were the instigators, even if dozens of witnesses pointed it out, even if it would be fair. Such trivialities simply do not concern him. Quote, Snape showed no less fervent care for his team. He booked the pitch for Slytherin so often that the Gryffindor team sometimes couldn't practice. He turned a deaf ear to complaints that Slytherins tried to take out rivals in the corridors. Alicia Spinett came to the hospital wing. Her eyebrows were growing so fast and thick that they completely covered her eyes and already interfered with eating. And although 14 witnesses proved that she was hexed from behind by Slytherin keeper Miles Bletchley. While she was in the library, Snape refused to listen to them and said she probably tried to apply a hair-growing charm on herself. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix Slytherins practically get away with everything, while students from other houses are reprimanded for any misdeed or even a hint of one. And of course, in his classes, Severus leaves his own charges untouched, preferring to nitpick at outsiders. No wonder Slytherin constantly wins the school cup. Indeed, if the other three houses are always busy with detentions and punishments from Snape, Misconception number three, the best teacher in the world. You know Severus Snape is a true genius who, unlike bookworm Hermione, does not just memorize material but understands magic on such a level that he can create his own spells and make amendments to the recipes of existing potions. And all this while still in school. Astonishing. However, for all his incredible abilities, he's not much of a teacher. No, that's an incorrect statement. Severus simply lacks the desire to teach children potion-making. He finds it uninteresting. As a result, students have to learn most of the material on their own, while Snape merely points out mistakes and punishes the most negligent students. Of course, awkward and absent-minded Longbottom suffers the most. Believe me, his fear of the professor did not arise out of nowhere. For example, once Snape decided to teach Neville a lesson by putting no less the life of his beloved Toad at stake. Quote Inul, come here, everyone, Snape called, his eyes glinting. 
Let's see what happens to Longbottom's toad. A correctly brewed potion will turn it into a tadpole. If Longbottom has ruined the brew, which I do not doubt, his toad will die. The Gryffindors waited apprehensively. The Slytherins were jubilant. Snape took Trevor, scooped up a spoonful of the potion, now green, and poured it into the toad's mouth. Dead sealants and sweet, Trevor swallowed, pop! turned into a tadpole and started squirming in Snape's palm. Five points from Gryffindor, Snape announced, and the smiles vanished from the Gryffindor's faces. I remember, Miss Granger. I forbade helping Longbottom. Class dismissed. Harry, Ron, and Hermione left the class. As they climbed the stairs to the hall, Harry thought about Malfoy's words, and Ron was still boiling with anger. To take five points from us for a perfect potion. Why didn't you speak up, Hermione? You could have said Neville brewed it himself. Just lie for once. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Snape was very keen to lay the responsibility for the death of a beloved pet on Neville. Apparently believing this would help him learn better, extreme methods for this teacher, however. But what am I saying? For him, it's nothing to poison a student to test an antidote. Quote, Let's work on antidotes! The real Snape scanned the class with malevolently twinkling eyes. Are your compositions ready? Now carefully brew them. After that, we'll pick someone and test their effects on them. His eyes met Harry's gaze, and Harry understood Snape was about to poison him. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire of course, Snape wouldn't allow anyone, even Harry, to seriously suffer or die. Of that I have no doubt. However, the very fact that you're about to be poisoned and then experimented on is a bit disconcerting. Who knows what effect an antidote prepared by Neville or Goyle might have, and I can't vouch for the rest either. In short, it's a terrifying situation. So go ahead and attend Snape's classes who's so bored he's literally a step away from organizing survival games. You can choose as you like, but I'll opt for Rickman's version. Better to receive flicks on the head. Snape in the film seems to have a penchant for physical reprimands than all of this. But to be fair, when Severus was finally allowed to teach defense against the dark arts, his lessons changed for the better. Though he remained just as strict and biased, all students, including Gryffindors, suddenly noted that Snape's classes had become interesting. He began to engage with his students, discuss the material with them, and answer questions. Some even compared Severus to Harry, and that says a lot. Misconception number four, worst memory. I must note that sometimes even the impulsive Snape from the books behaves much more prudently than his version in the adaptation. For example, during occlumency lessons, he hid in the pensive those memories that Potter, but most surprisingly, Snape tried to teach Potter occlumency seriously, without any bias or nitpicking. If Severus pointed out mistakes, it was only those that Harry actually made. Sometimes he even offered praise. What a contrast. Evidently, Snape considered these lessons extremely important for protecting Potter. Hence the changes. It's just a pity that Harry, once again, did not appreciate the professor's efforts. Quote, not as bad as I expected for the first time, said Snape, and raised his wand again. In the end, you managed to stop me, though you wasted time and energy screaming. You need to focus, repel me mentally, and you won't need to resort to using a wand. I'm trying, Harry retorted angrily, but you're not explaining how. Don't get smart, Potter. Snape threatened. Now I want you to close your eyes to Dutta here. Protego. Snape staggered. The tip of his wand flew upwards. It no longer pointed at Harry. And suddenly, memories flooded into Harry's consciousness. Memories that were not his own. A hook-nosed man shouting at a cowering woman while a black-haired boy cried in a corner. A teenager with greasy hair sat alone in a dark bedroom, pointing his wand at the ceiling and knocking down flies. A girl laughing at a skinny boy trying to mount a bucking broomstick. 
Enough. Well, Potter, it seems we've made some progress. Snape, breathing heavily, adjusted the pensieve, where he had again hidden several of his thoughts before the lesson began, checking if they were still there. I don't remember advising you to use shield charms. However, they undoubtedly proved effective. Shall we try again, all right? said Snape. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Yes, unlike in the film, after the ill-fated Protego, Snape didn't dismiss Harry but praised him for progress and continued the lessons. He dismissed him later. After Potter rudely intruded into the pensive to see the memories Snape was hiding from him, and in this situation, Harry was entirely at fault. Misconception number five. Unpleasant details. Do you think I've gone too far? The video turned out to be gigantic, and there are still many examples I'd like to mention. Let's at least briefly talk about the most interesting ones. Firstly, it was Snape who told the Slytherins about Lupin being a werewolf. The film chose to omit this fact. Someone let slip about the nature of my condition. Quote, Do you hear that? Hagrid got serious. He lowered his voice, though there was no one around. Well, Snape, that is, told all the Slytherins. Decided, right, let everyone know. That uh, Professor Lupin, uh, he, see, is a werewolf. He was roaming the fields last night. Now he's, understandably, this packing his bags. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Secondly, he mocked Hermione's appearance. When Malfoy's spell caused her teeth to grow at an unimaginable speed, Snape not only didn't punish Draco, but snidely claimed he saw no change in his student's appearance. He didn't even let her leave the class. Hermione had to leave the lesson on her own and run to the hospital wing as no one intended to help her. Quote, Look what Malfoy's done to Hermione, Ron appealed to him. Hermione tried to cover her growing teeth with her hands, but they had already touched the collar of her robe. Slytherin girls approaching from behind Snape pointed at her, barely holding back their laughter. Snape looked at her coldly. If there are any changes, they are very slight, he concluded. Hermione sobbed loudly, turned on her heels, and ran to the staircase leading upstairs. Harry and Ron, fortunately, shouted at Snape together, fortunately because their voices echoed in the hollow stone corridor, and the teacher definitely couldn't hear exactly what they were hurling at him, but he got the general gist. "'Have you calmed down?' Snape said silkily. "'Now listen. Minus fifty points from Gryffindor.' Potter and Weasley will stay after class. I'll announce what the punishment will be. Now, back to class. Otherwise, you'll be punished for a week. Harry's ears were ringing. Such injustice. If only he could hex Snape himself. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Uh, thirdly, it was he who caused George to lose an ear. Yes, accidentally. Severus wanted to help Lupin. But the fact remains... His fondness for the Sectum Sempra spell nearly cost one of the Weasleys his life, as a slight miss would have made the wound fatal. Quote, Snape made an effort, said Lupin. Snape, Harry exclaimed. You didn't say his hood fell off during the chase, and Sectum Sempra has always been Snape's favorite weapon. I would have liked to say I repaid him in kind, but all my strength went into keeping George on his broom. He lost a lot of blood after the injury. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Fourthly, he called Lily a mudblood in gratitude for her help. Yeah. The films portray the relationship between this pair very rosily. It's not immediately clear why the girl preferred James, leaving her childhood friend out in the cold. But the books delve into this theme very thoroughly. Quote, Leave him alone! Lily shouted. She had also drawn her wand. James and Sirius watched her warily. Listen, Evans, don't make me fight you, James said seriously. Then take the spell off him. James sighed heavily, turned to Snape, and muttered the counter-curse. There, 
he said when Snape struggled to his feet again. Your lucky Evans was here, Snivellus. I don't need help from filthy mudbloods like her. Lily squinted. Fine, she said calmly. Next time I won't interfere. By the way, if I were you, I'd wash your underwear, Snivellus, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Misconception number six, Lily, and this is a very important point. The films depict Severus as simply a nice boy who befriends Lily. And then he suddenly turns into a loyal servant of Voldemort. What happened? Did he decide to join the dark side because his friend left him? No, it's much more complicated. Doesn't it seem like I've gone a bit too far? The article has become simply gigantic, and there are still many examples I would like to mention. Let's at least briefly talk about the most interesting ones. Firstly, it was Snape who told the Slytherins about Lupin being a werewolf. The film decided to remain silent on this fact. Someone blabbed about the nature of my affliction. Quote, You didn't hear? Hagrid got serious. He lowered his voice, though there was nobody around. Well, Snape, that is told all the Slytherins, decided, right, let everyone know. That Professor Lupin, he's, you know, a werewolf. Had him roaming the fields last night. Now he's understandably this, packing his bags. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, if not for the prophecy, if Voldemort had chosen the Longbottoms instead of the Potters, Snape would have remained a loyal servant of the Dark Lord, an exemplary Death Eater. Dumbledore's involvement was not driven by a desire to atone for his sins or a willingness to reform, but merely the hope of protecting Lily. That's the character we're talking about. But I must note that the incident left a deep mark on Snape's soul, and from then on he reacted with hatred to the word mudblood. Of course, unless it threatened his cover. Quote, and Snape stood again in the headmaster's office while Phineas Nigellus hurriedly returned to his portrait. Director, they've broken into a tent in the Dean Forest, the mudblood. I do not wish to hear that word. Well, that Granger mentioned the location when opening her bag, I heard. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. The adaptation also softly skirted around the fact that Snape didn't care about the lives of Harry, an innocent child, and James. He only wanted to save Lily, and if in the film we hear such a phrase, hide her, hide them all, then the book introduces an interesting context. Her quote, If she means so much to you, soon, said Dumbledore, surely Lord Voldemort will spare her. Couldn't you ask for mercy for the mother in exchange for the son? I. I asked. You disgust me, said Dumbledore. Harry had never heard such contempt in his voice. Snape recoiled slightly. You mean to say that you don't care if her husband and son die? Let them die as long as you get what you want? Snape looked down, not taking his eyes off Dumbledore. Then hide them all, he croaked. Save her, them please. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. Severus Snape is a character with a complex nature who made many foolish mistakes in his life that he later regretted. And despite a long and difficult path to redemption, he never fully changed, remaining much the same repressed and embittered child, taking out on Harry the grievances once caused by his father. As Dumbledore correctly noted, some wounds time cannot heal, they are too deep. Yet despite all his numerous flaws, Severus Snape is a true hero who dedicated his life to protecting the Chosen One and many others, and made a significant contribution to the victory over Voldemort. In this, the two versions of the character are very similar. Snape from the films just took the best traits of the book's hero shedding many of his flaws and controversial moments, making him more likable than originally intended. And while this approach made the character very popular, it in turn almost stripped him of the very ambiguity he is often credited with. 
but I hope this lengthy quote and explanation filled video helped you better understand why Severus Snape is considered such. Thank you for watching to this point. I hope this means you found it interesting, and if so, don't forget to like, share your opinions in the comments, and subscribe to the channel.